This is CPSC 526, Lecture 5 on Kerberos and Mediated Key Exchange. So in this lecture, we're going to be talking about Kerberos, the three-headed dog that guards Hades. And in specific, it's as a protocol for doing key exchange, establishing session keys between two entities. Now, Kerberos is, relatively speaking, relative to computer science, quite an old idea, quite an old technology, but it has proven itself to be a time-tested tool. It's still in use today. It's still in, in quite significant use today. And not only that, its core ideas are even more widely used. So Kerberos really solved an important problem, which is, if you imagine just a metaphor or the sort of working example you can keep in your mind, you have a bunch of people who are employees and they want to print on a printer. And that printer doesn't know anything about them. It doesn't know their password. And it would be unreasonable to have everyone basically have their own user account for every single printer and also type their password to access the printer every single time they wanted to print something. So Kerberos was set up to abstract away authentication from the delivery of services. The core idea is a key distribution center, a KDC. This is a central trusted party. So this KDC knows all of the nodes on the network. It knows all the users. It knows all the printers. It knows anything that might require service or provide service. And the KDC has an authentic channel with all these nodes. So the idea being here, if you imagine it as a graph, you have a hub and spoke like topology. You have many, many users and they all can directly talk to the KDC and the KDC, because they share a key or a password or something like that, and the KDC can directly talk to, in turn, all of the other users or all of the other services. So if Alice wants to talk to Bob, where Alice is a user and Bob is a printer, Alice could say, go to the KDC, and say, hey, could you send this message to Bob? It, the KDC is trusted, so we assume that the KDC won't eavesdrop or do any attacks like that. The U Alice has a password with the KDC that allows them to establish a key somehow, and the KDC has a password with Bob that allows them to establish a key somehow, and so Alice sends her message to the KDC, who sends the message to Bob. Right, Or you can imagine Alice knows the KDC's public key and the KDC knows everyone else's public keys because when the employee joins the organization, they provide their public key and that allows them to take part. That allows them to be a, a member of the organization. And now there is an authentic channel between every node and the KDC, which means that any two nodes can connect to each other authentically over two hops first to the KDC, and then to the other node. So what can go wrong with this, right? And I encourage you to pause and think about this. What's wrong with this approach? What are the things that can go wrong? Well, we have a number of things. The KDC could be untrusted, for example. We might, you know, there might be an, an attack in that regard, that the KDC is not a trusted entity. But aside from security, there's just a plain problem of availability. Now we have this one single entity that is in the middle of all communication. So not only does it know more than it needs to know, it doesn't need to know all of the communication that's happening between every Alice and Bob. But, you know, even if it does and is trusted, it still is involved in all this communication, which is a lot of communication, right? We have, instead of a distributed system where people are just talking to other people, we have every single message going through one single trusted party that has to be protected and made sure that it's not compromised and not attacked and so on. So having a single central KDC is, is not an ideal situation, especially if it's going to actually have to be responsible to decrypt all the traffic, re-encrypt it, and, and, and transmit it. It's a huge computational burden for the KDC. So in principle, what I've described so far, the operation of the KDC works like such. Alice would say to the KDC, I want to talk to Bob. KDC invents a random key, KAB, and gives the key KAB to Alice and gives the key KAB to Bob. Now Alice and Bob can talk to each other directly. So this is better. 
this is better than just it going through everything and it being must have decrypted everything and re-encrypted everything. Now, in this case, the KDC still knows what the key is. It, there's no key negotiation. That having said that, I mean, once Alice and Bob have a key, they could use that to secure communication, do a key negotiation, and then use the new key that's negotiated, protected by the fact that the key negotiation parameters were encrypted. But despite that, suppose that Alice and Bob just used the key that the KDC provided them, this KAB. What can go wrong? Well, we still have these availability issues. The KDC is still involved in every single pair of communications. Alice wants to talk to Bob. The KDC has to be online. If the KDC is not online, if Alice can't reach it for some reason, then there's no, there's no communication that can happen. Now, second to that, and this is much more of a likely scenario, because we can imagine the KDC is high availability, it's always running, you know, there's a lot of effort to make sure it's, it continues operations. But what if Bob isn't online? Alice wants to talk to Bob, but Bob's not even in the office yet. Well, the KDC then can't reach Bob, so it can't give case of AB to Bob. So we have this as an availability problem, and this is far more likely because we could invest the resources to make the KDC robust and always available, but we still can't make Bob show up to work on time. So what can we do? Another approach. Alice goes to the KDC and says, I want to talk to Bob. KDC invents a random key, K sub AB. The KDC then tells Alice, use K sub AB for Bob. And I, I'm using a notation here that I'm going to use throughout this lecture. When I use uh, braces and then a, afterwards comes a key, it means that the contents of the data in, of the, inside the brace is protected with that key. So use K sub AB for Bob. That's encrypted with K sub A. And then here is the magic part. Use K sub AB for Alice encrypted with K sub B. The key distribution center gives to Alice the message that Alice is now supposed to deliver to Bob. And we call this a ticket in Kerberos. So Alice is now the one who's responsible to find Bob and tell Bob, here's the key that we're supposed to use. Now, it's not just coming arbitrarily. It's not that Bob can be fooled. This key is encrypted with a key that only Bob knows. The KDC, we assume, knows K sub A, which is Alice's key to talk to the KDC, and it knows K sub B, which is a Bob's key to talk to the KDC. So every single user has their own private key known only to them and the KDC. And they get this, you know, when they join the company, when they enroll or something like that, when they create their account. They establish some shared secret between the KDC and their particular user. And what the KDC does is it encrypts the message that Bob needs to know for Bob and gives that message to Alice, knowing that Alice cannot decrypt it, cannot tamper with it. It is encrypted. It is protected by the fact that Alice or that that it is Bob is the only other entity other than the KDC who knows case of B. Therefore, when they decrypt this message, they see a nice, well-formed message that says use case of AB when you're talking to Alice. We call this a ticket. And the idea is that Alice is responsible to give the ticket to Bob. So Alice would then go to Bob when he shows up. Hi, I'm Alice. By the way, there's this ticket from the KDC which says, use case of AB when you're talking to Alice. And it's encrypted with K sub B. So what can go wrong here? And this what can go wrong question, this is just a question you should always be asking yourself. This is the sort of security mindset that I'm talking about. It's not necessarily that something can go wrong, or maybe it's, some, it's broken beyond repair, or maybe it's just a small issue. right? But you should always be thinking about that. What can go wrong? So, for example, in this case... It could be the case that, for instance, this ticket has no notion of time. So Alice might not even work there anymore. There's no notion that Bob should be talking to Alice, that Alice is someone that 
for instance, if Bob is a printer, that Alice is someone who should be using Bob. Right? Maybe Alice has lost her job recently at the firm and should not be printing anymore. But this same ticket, Alice could just use this ticket years later because all it says is use this key when talking to me. So Kerberos was based on two protocols, or inspired by, in a sense, two protocols proposed by Needham Schroeder. And the Needham Schroeder protocols, the goal was this idea of key transport. So you have an insecure network of untrusted entities. You, there's no encryption by default. And you're trying to deliver a key from one computer to another so that you can use it to start talking. And you have this trusted third party whose job is to mediate this key exchange. You don't need to exchange keys with everyone before communicating. It's not like every single user and every single printer and every single possible pair of people needs to exchange their own private keys and do that privately and remember them all. There's a single trusted third party and everyone knows that trusted third party and that trusted third party does the key exchange. And they propose two types of key exchange protocols or key delivery, key transport protocols, a symmetric key version where you establish a session key, like AES, an AES type of key, and a public key version. And the idea of the public key version was to provide mutual authentication so that Alice and Bob knew that they were talking to each other. Unfortunately, both protocols were broken as they were proposed. That is, that they were proposed in a certain way, and then later was revealed to have design flaws that rendered it vulnerable to attack. And this is because security and cryptography, this is hard to get right. There's a lot of details. There's a lot of different attacks. And some of the attacks, especially in the beginning of the times of developing crypto, hadn't even been thought of yet. So people are coming up with new attacks. Existing protocols are vulnerable to them. And even if you were to design a protocol it may still be vulnerable to an attack. And even if you knew all the attacks and you looked at your protocol, you might still not even notice what the attack is. So here's the first protocol. And we'll go through the protocol and then afterwards I'll, I'll, I'll show you what the vulnerability is in it. So the notation that we're using, we're going to see a, f a bunch of more of these sort of diagrams. So it's basically there's actors, Alice, Bob, and the server. The server is the trusted third party trusted by both Alice and Bob. And when you see in the main part of the protocol, these five lines, A arrow S means that Alice sends to the server a message, colon, and then the message contents. So Alice sends to the server, colon, A comma B comma N sub A. So A and B would correspond to usernames. So it's basically just saying Alice and Bob. And as we can see from the notation, N sub X means a random nonce generated by X. So N sub A would be a random nonce generated by A, Alice. What's a nonce? A number to be used once. We talked about this before. These are random numbers. They don't need to be cryptographically secure random numbers. They don't need to be unguessable. They just can't repeat. So you're supposed to pick some random number, N sub X. K sub X, Y is a symmetric key known only by X and Y. So K sub A comma B would be a key only known by A, Alice and Bob. A, uh, K sub A, S would be Alice and the server, B, S, Bob and the server. So, and then we have, again, the notation with the, the braces. Braces around data followed by a key means that data is encrypted with that key. So that's a notation that we're going to be using in this lecture. Now let's look at the protocol. Alice sends to the server, Alice, Bob, and Anons. What this means is Alice is saying to the server, Hi, I'm Alice. I want to talk to Bob. Here's my random number. I'm giving you a random number. The server then gives to Alice a message that's encrypted with the Alice end server encryption key. So if, if Alice just cold mailed the server an encrypted message, without any indication of who Alice is, the server would have to try every single key it knew to try to decrypt it, and then find the one that corresponds to someone, and, and then reply. 
And this, might, in turn, might be vulnerable to some uh, attacks, like a replay type attack where someone could figure out who someone is or something like that. So, the first message where Alice says to the server an identity is to basically acting as a username. Alice is logging in, in a way. The server replies with a message encrypted such that only Alice can read it. So if Alice has just said uh, Alice, then Alice can decrypt this message. But if Eve was the one who said, Hi, I'm Alice and I want to talk to Bob, the server would say, All right, here, here you go. Here's the message that only Alice can decrypt. And then Eve would be out of luck. So the message that the server replies with includes Alice's nonce, which means that Alice knows the server was able to encrypt it. Alice knows that the server received NSAB correctly, that the server isn't being spoofed, because Alice can assume that the only entity that knows KAS is Alice and the server, and Alice knows it didn't produce this message, so it must have been the server. Epistemological evidence, that is. And then the server also provides this random key, KAB, so we imagine this is just freshly generated. The idea is the server says, picks a random key, says, here, Alice and Bob, this is the key you're going to use to talk to each other. It includes Bob's identity, again, encrypted with KAS. So Alice knows that this isn't another message. For instance, suppose Alice says, I want to talk to Charles and I want to talk to Dan and gets two replies back. Alice knows which reply this is for. Who, which, which, it, is it Bob? Is it Al, or is it Charles? Is it Dan? It knows which person should be using this key. And then it includes a ticket. It includes the encryption of KAB and Alice encrypted for Bob with KBS, the key that Bob and the server share. Bob has KBS, we assume, so Bob can decrypt this message. So Bob is able to know the identity of of Alice, the person who wants to talk to him, and this key that he should use when talking to her. So then, the next step is, Alice goes to Bob, whenever Bob shows up, and says, here's the ticket, K-A-B, comma, A. Just gives the ticket to Bob. Bob is able to decrypt the ticket, see the key, see Alice's name, conclude, oh, I must be talking to Alice. And then Bob generates his own nonce, N sub B, and delivers that to Alice. Alice, if it is truly Alice, would be the only other entity other than the server who knows KAB, is able to decrypt the nonce, and then replies back to Bob with the nonce minus one. Why the nonce minus one? I, you, there's many things we could do. Basically, what we're doing is we're computing some non-trivial function that you can only do if you knew the key. If I had the encryption of five, I couldn't produce the encryption of six with the same key if I didn't have the key. I couldn't decrypt the message, see that it's five, add one to it, and re-encrypt it. If I looked at the encryption of 5 and the encryption of 6, they're just going to be wildly different, and I would not be able to reliably figure out what the, the encrypted message I'm trying to deliver would be. So by Alice computing some non-trivial function on N sub B, that is subtracting one from it and re decrypting it, subtracting one, re-encrypting it, sending back to Bob, Bob is able to say, aha, the person on the other end of the socket that I'm talking to, they know what this key is. They, they, they're able to, uh, it's not some Eve who's just delivered this ticket to Bob and Bob just then trusts them. However, this has a flaw. So what is the flaw? So I encourage you, to pause and think about this. And of course, I had to pause the recording to remember what the answer is myself. So it's, it's not that it's obvious or something like that, but it can be fun to really think through this and, 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 and try to find what the attack is on these protocols. And so before I reveal it, I would also add that one tip 
to doing this is to think about all the kinds of attacks we know. There's man in the middle attack, there's replay attack, there's mafia attack. Is it one of those, for instance? And how would you mount such an attack? And if you could mount it, how would it work? And then if it would it be vulnerable, right? So I do encourage you to, to give that a try just for the sheer enjoyment of it. And now I'll, I'll reveal the answer, which is, in fact, the attack is a, a replay attack. That is, if, for example, an Eve character learned K sub AB somehow, at some point in time, just once, just learned one key one single time in history, as well monitor the network so they got the ticket that was delivered, line three, Alice sends to Bob K sub AB, comma A encrypted with K sub BS, if there was an Eve character who knew KAB, just somehow figured it out by, you know, compromising one of the computers, and monitored the network so they saw this ticket being delivered, for the rest of time, they could just start the protocol at line three. They could deliver the ticket as was. Bob receives the ticket. Bob replies with N sub B, encrypted with key KAB. Eve knows KAB, can compute this minus one function and communicate then after. So, in this sense, it's secure under the assumption that Alice, or that Eve rather, would never learn KAB, which is the goal, right? Eve shouldn't learn this, but it's vulnerable in the sense that if Eve ever once learns this, the protocol is broken forever afterwards which is not ideal. So how do we fix this? Well, one fix is to amend the first two lines. So at the very start of the protocol, Alice talks to the server. Now we change that, the Alice to the server and the server's response. We get rid of those two lines and we replace it with these four lines, which is that Alice goes to Bob and says, hi, I'm Alice. Bob then replies, okay, here's the ticket for the server. Alice, and the ticket for the server is Alice's name and a nonce, n sub prime, or n sub b prime, encrypted with the key for the server. So this purported Alice that Bob has yet to trust gives Alice a ticket to render to the server. The server can decrypt it, because the server has k sub bs, sees the nonce n sub b, and what does it do with it? Well, it then replies back to Alice and includes n sub b prime in the ticket that Alice is to render back to Bob. So why does this fix the flaw? Well, whenever a new communication is about to occur, Alice says to Bob, Hi, I'm Alice. Bob then says, Here's a, a random number that I want to hear back from you. I want to hear it back from you, but encrypted from the server. Include it in the ticket that will come my way later on. Which means that every single time Bob's about to talk to someone new, or someone a second time, or some person again, they're expecting this new, fresh, random number that they wouldn't have seen before. This thwarts the replay attack. Because now, if Eve wants to talk to Bob, the first thing Eve has to do, let's say Eve knew K sub AB for some existing one in the past, the first thing Eve would have to do is say, hi, I'm Alice. Bob says, all right, here's a ticket for the server. And that replayed message, the one that Eve captured that we have here when Alice sends to Bob line number three, the one that Eve would then replay is useless because Eve can't replay it with a freshly random nonce. And this goes to the point of why these nonces, they don't need to be unguessable. It doesn't help if Eve can predict the nonce. Bob could just use number one, number two, the next time, number three, the time after that. It doesn't matter that they're predictable. What matters is that Bob doesn't use it again. And that's the difference between a nonce, which is serving this purpose of in effect, randomizing this protocol versus a 
unguessable random number that's used for something like a, a, the key case of AB, the, you know, the random number that the server picks that should become the key. If Eve could guess case of AB, the protocol is trivially broken. But if Eve can guess the nonce, the protocol still works. Eve still can't get encryptions of nonces and deliver them to Bob if, if Bob is using fresh nonces every time. So that's the first of the two protocols. Here's the second of the two protocols. This is the public key version of the Needham Schroeder protocol. Again, our notation is the same. So Alice, Bob, and a server. And now we have public key world. So we have k sub px would be the public key for x, where x is either Alice or Bob or the server. We have k sub x, which is the private key. So px is the public key, x is the private key. And as well, if we have some parentheses around data, sub a uh, followed by px, it means encrypted for x. That is, x is the only one who can decrypt it. And if it is some data, bracy x, this means that it's signed by that entity. Signed by x. So how does this protocol work? It begins, Alice goes to the server and says, Alice and Bob. I, I'm Alice, I want to talk to Bob. The server then says to Alice, all right, here is Bob's public key and includes Bob's identity. So if Alice was, you know, at asking at the same time to talk to Charles and Dan, Alice can sort these messages correctly. And it's signed by the server. So we assume that everyone knows the, the server's public key, that they're a trusted entity. But Alice doesn't know Bob's public key. And this is the idea of this protocol. We want to bootstrap trust. Everyone knows the server. So we have this hub and spoke graph where every entity knows the central server. And we're trying to establish pairwise communications between Alice and Bob, where Alice can talk to Bob without actually knowing Bob's public key ahead of time. It gets a authentic version of it from the server. Alice says to the server, I want, give me Bob's pu public key. The server gives Bob's public key back and it signs it. So the server, Alice knows that this is the authentic public key, or at least as far as the server understands it to be. Alice then goes to Bob and says, here's a nonce, here's a random number and my name. And it is encrypted for Bob because again, public key cryptography, Alice or anyone with a public key can encrypt a message that only Bob can read. Now at this point, Bob just receives a message that he can decrypt that says I'm Alice and here's a random number, but it, there's no evidence it's from Alice. There's no evidence that Alice was the, anyone could create this message. Anyone could create a message with a random number and Alice's name and encrypt it for Bob. That's the nature of public key cryptography. So what does Bob do to ensure that it really is Alice? Well, Bob goes to the server and says, hi, I'm Bob, I want to talk to Alice. And the server then replies back to Bob with Alice's public key as well, signed by the server, exact same way as step two. Now Bob gets Alice's public key Bob then goes to Alice and, with knowledge of her public key, is able to encrypt a message that only she can understand. And he encrypts a message, N sub A, N sub B. N sub A is the random number that he received from Alice. So he's replying it to Alice. And N sub B is his randomness. And... In response to this message, Alice then replies to Bob and sub B encrypted with Bob's public key. So Alice was able to decrypt this message, take the second part out, take the second number out, re-encrypt it for Bob and send it back. Right? Again, computing a non-trivial function on this. Right? Because N sub A is N sub B, if when it's delivered encrypted, it's just a binary string. And it's not the case that the second half of it would be a perfect encryption that for Bob that Alice could just reply. No, it's an entirely different key. So being able to decrypt this message 
take the second number out, re-encrypt it, send it back to Bob. That's a non-trivial operation. You would have to have the key, the, the, the corresponding private key, in order to do that operation. And at this point in the protocol, we only really have authentication. We only have this idea that Alice and Bob are truly Alice and Bob talking to each other. But you can see we can jump to a key negotiation protocol pretty quickly from here. For instance, N sub A plus N sub B could be the key, right? These two random nonces, you mash them together, that becomes the key. Now, if we were to do that, we would no longer be able to rely on on just un, our, our, our new randomness that's not cryptographically suitable for the nonces. If we wanted to then use the nonces to do something cryptographically important, like an encryption key, we would also need to have that the nonces are encrypted. But of course, there's other. we could do a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. You know, there's a number of things that we could do once we know that we have each other's public keys, we can sign messages, we can verify the signatures, we can exchange messages, we have authentication. So the goal of this protocol is to establish an authentic channel between two entities that don't only know each other's names, basically. Nevertheless, there is a flaw. And so again, I encourage you to pause and, and look at the protocol and, and see if you can find the flaw. And again, throwing all of the different types of attacks that we know can happen. Man in the middle, replay attack, mafia fraud. And see if the attack sort of appears to you. If you can, if you can guess this attack or predict this attack, and so the answer is yes. There's a, a, an attack. It's a mafia fraud attack. So uh, we've already talked about mafia fraud. The idea here is that if there's an Eve character, and Eve can somehow convince Alice to talk to her, so Eve is. For instance, Alice, Bob, and Eve all work together, and Alice has every reason to talk to Eve, and Alice doesn't mistrust Eve, but Eve can exploit this to perform an attack, an imposter attack on Bob, pretending to be Alice. So how does this work? So suppose Alice goes to the server and says, Hi, server. I'm Alice. I want to talk to Eve. And the server says, All right, here's Eve's public key with its signature. Alice goes to Eve and says, all right, Eve, here's my nonce, N sub A. Eve can decrypt this. Eve can decrypt, we're at line three. Eve can decrypt N sub A. So Eve can re-encrypt it for Bob because Eve knows Bob's public key. Eve can just go to the server and say, what's Bob's public key and get it. So Eve then encrypts N sub A for Bob Bob is able to decrypt this message and replies back to Eve. Now, at this point, the message Bob receives is a nonce and Alice's name. So it's coming from some socket. It's coming from some IP address. Bob doesn't know who's at the other end of that IP address. The only thing he knows is the person who's at the other end says they're Alice and here's a random number. So Bob then says to Eve, okay, here is my random number, N sub B, and it's encrypted with Alice's public key, right? Bob goes to the server, gets the public key for Alice, and, and, and is able to encrypt this message. Bob sends this to Eve. Now, here's the elegance of this attack. Eve can't decrypt this message. Eve is unable to do anything with this. But Eve can use Alice as an oracle to give her the answer. Because the last line of the actual protocol consists of Alice repeating back to Bob the number that Bob gave to Alice. The random number that Bob gave to Alice. And at this point in the protocol, Eve thinks she's, or Alice thinks she's talking to Eve. Alice's plan was to talk to Eve. Alice wanted to talk to Eve. That was the entire beginning of the protocol. Alice said to the server, I want to talk to Eve. So Eve delivers to Alice, N sub A, N sub B, encrypted for Alice, 
Eve can't decrypt this, just gives it back verbatim. Whatever Alice receives from Bob, or whatever Eve receives from Bob, Eve forwards directly to Alice. Eve then, or Alice then, decrypts that message, as only Alice could, confirms that N sub A is there, the number that she provided, learns N sub B, and then, by the design of the protocol, gives it back to Alice. Or gives it back to Eve. So Alice encrypts for Eve using Eve's public key and sub B. This is simply how the protocol works. If you draw out the original protocol and you merge in this additional attack, you can see ex exactly this operation where the first, when N sub A, N sub B passes through Eve, Eve doesn't learn it. But on the way back, when Alice delivers the final message, that's the moment when Eve learns N sub B. And the last line is a mistake. It should be E goes to B. E goes to B. N sub B encrypted for Bob. At this point, Eve now knows Bob's nonce. And at this point, then, Bob would be convinced that he's talking to Alice. And all that was required was that Alice intentionally began a communication with Eve. That Alice wanted to talk to Eve for some reason. And if that's the case, this entire protocol is broken, as it was proposed, because... Eve can then imposter anyone who's willing to talk to Eve to anyone else that would be uh, on the same network, part of the same protocol, that sort of thing. So this was fixed by the person who discovered the attack, Lo, and so the resulting protocol, Nieder Schrodem Lo, and what I love about this solution is it's, it's, it's so utterly simple. The solution to this attack is on the second last line of the protocol. When Bob says to Alice, N sub A, N sub B encrypted with Alice's public key, all that changes is that he includes his name. That's it. If Bob just repeats his name on that last mess or the second last message, the last one he delivers to Alice, then Alice would realize there's an attack at this point. Right? The entire attack works because Eve is able to verbatim deliver whatever Bob sends her onwards to Alice, and Alice effectively acts as an entity that decrypts the message and gives it back to Eve by design. Alice cooperates to decrypt the message that Eve can't read and needs to know in order for the attack to work. And so it's thwarted by Bob just saying his name in that second last line so that Alice says, wait a minute, why is Bob's name there? I thought I was talking to Eve. 